All right, today let's do a, a fun and whimsical jar project. Uh, it's going to be a little jar with a horizontally opening front and uh, we'll put a big cork in it and uh, when it's done it's also going to be wire wrapped uh, though I'm not going to whiteboard that portion of it just the the flamework portion uh, but we will show it when it's finished uh, in the complete uh, and elegantly elaborated version so we're going to have the the vessel portion here uh, the opening facing here of course that's the the horizontal part and we're going to have one of the goblet uh, feet on it with the gold fuming and the small flowers and leaves stamped into the base. We'll have our uh, mushroom marble back here and then a couple smaller marbles that are just, they, they appear clear but they actually fluoresce in different lighting uh, like in a black light. And then we'll have uh, a vine pattern running around the center of it and amber dots on either side. Okay, let's uh, start off we'll make the mushroom marble which we've shown in other videos so I'm not going to go into too much depth in it right here and then we'll add a couple of little marbles descending in size on it there and I'm going to put a punty on it to this side here and then I'm going to put that into the kiln then I'm going to take a piece of the uh, inch and a quarter uh, heavy wall tubing and hook it up to some of the nine and a half handle which again we've done that before in many of our other videos so I'm going to kind of skip over that. Uh, then we're going to add a vine pattern down the middle using cobalt over white and then little green leaves and then we'll do some amber uh, translucent amber dots over here and then we will heat the whole thing up really well get it uh, to condense down and then I'm going to grab a pair of uh, the tong molds. You could use the wooden paddles. You could use marble molds. There's any number of ways of uh, helping get it round quickly there. Uh, and we'll be using a blow hose to blow that out into it while, while spinning it in front of us. And then the next step will be to add that piece that we had in the kiln with the mushroom marble on the end and the punty on it uh, up to our blown out design here and then remove and cut off right here in the flame wall blowing out again using the blow hose to separate that so that we have this portion here Let me see if I can find it in my camera there there we go now we got it we got the the mushroom marble is now our handle we've blown this open and now we want to round this out we can do it somewhat with just a small tool and rotating it but it may have uh, some oval to it that you may not be able to really get out that way. So I'm going to heat up the whole thing and then go in with this large diameter short distance octagonal reamer and round it out so that it comes out just really nice and round so it'll take a cork or a rubber plug very well. And uh, then we'll add our goblet foot which again we've made those in many of our other videos so I'm going to kind of gloss over them here but we'll weld that to the bottom here and I'm also going to add a little protuberance on the side uh, so that it'll be an anchor for the wire wrap when we put that onto it. And uh, then I'll cut this handle off over here, tap it off, fire polish that little spot, and we'll be back to having our uh, finished item here. I say finished, but again, we're going to wire wrap the heck out of it and add a, a few more uh, embellishments. So anyway, let's get to it. sped up mushroom here with some caramel on my left hand. It's about a five mil rod and that's a pretty thick rod. I believe that's one inch in my right hand. And uh, push it in, penetrate it, let it mushroom out. Uh, I'm doing it in the marvering pad to kind of push it together to try and prevent any bubble from going up. And then uh, back marvering it there on the bottom to keep it square and then adding a little base of another color, in this case one of my favorites just uh, cobalt uh, tubing that's encasing a uh, large diameter white rod and then pulled down. Makes a very smooth creamy color and blues are uh, very attractive. Uh, and then this is uh, just a big chunk of transparent amber I'm going to put on the bottom to round it out and give it some kind of uh, earthy look down there. 
join them together real well, marve them down, get everything nice and straight and clean. And uh, flipping the little arrowhead marver up there on the side for that uh, beveled knife edge, uh, I'm going to use that to separate the large diameter rod just above the mushroom cap. And by doing so, I'm preventing the cap of the mushroom from being stretched out. If I were to just heat the glass and pull it apart, the stretch would expand into the mushroom area. And I really want the mushroom to kind of retain its shape and then just have enough material up there on top to round it. Uh, here we go, rolling it in the little tong marvers. You can use just one side of the, the tong marble mold. Uh, it's really good for marvering is something into a round shape. It's also really good for grabbing uh, marbles and other items out of the kiln, uh, bringing them out, doing work to them while holding them, and then returning them into the kiln using that uh, throughout the, the process. So just separating some material here from the bottom. And then I'll round off the other end. And remember, the, the profile is all that really matters. When you place these lumps of uneven glass in there and rotate them around, uh, the size is irrelevant. It's just the amount of material is going to form a shoulder and round itself out. You've got to change the orientation, the direction of axis on it, give it a little bit more heat, polish up those ends and then round it out at a 90 degree. Now we've got a fairly round marble. Nice. And if that were all we were doing, we'd then be able to tap it off, uh, holding it in the tongs, fire polish it, and drop it in the kiln. But in this case, we're going to add some little more marbles to the side of this one in descending sizes. first one, and that's, uh, well, I believe, uh, Bluminati. It looks clear here, but when it's uh, hit with the black light, it fluoresces in a, in a blue spectrum. And the one next to it is uh, all a uh, uh, yellowish color. There we go. There's our smaller marbles. Uh, I'm going to use the last one here. And uh, this is, I believe, a, a fluorescing orange. And I'm just going to go ahead and use that as my punty at this point. So it's actually welded on pretty good. I could count on it. Um, I've removed the acute angle so it's not hooked up like a punty. It's actually fairly welded to it. Uh, again, watch some of our earlier videos if you need to see how to hook up the larger tube to the smaller tube that makes it more convenient handle. Uh, and again, I'm grabbing one of my favorites, the cobalt over white that's been pulled down. And I'm going to use this to make a bunch of vines that just go around the what's to be the jar. Just draw it on there. Keep the flame coming in uh, between the two materials as much as you can. Provide uh, enough heat that they weld together. And the whole thing comes out of the kiln really hot. So you've got a, a little bit of time to work on it. But work quickly and efficiently and then make sure that you maintain enough heat in the whole piece that where each of those little items is drawn on that you don't have an acute angle that creates a, a crack. They're very prone to do that. In your first few times you can almost expect that it is going to happen uh, until you learn exactly by failure how, how far you can push it. Or possibly by watching videos on YouTube. There we go. So each of these is just a little spur on the vine. Uh, each of those is going to get three little green leaves uh, at the end. And then we'll place the parallel rows of amber dots alongside. Again, I'm just heating it up a little bit, making the whole thing uh, crack resistant. And at the end of uh, each of those pieces, as I'm drawing them on, there's a, there's a little tiny back push, uh, a back pedal, and that prevents creating an acute angle at the tip of each of these items that you're drawing on. Yes, push it forward, but pull it back as you're pulling it out of the flame, and that backwards pull will remove
remove most of your acute angle issues. This is uh, jade, which can be a little bit bubbly uh, the first time that you pull it down. I found that if I run it through my flame and pull it down about halfway, and then run it through again and pull it down the rest of the way, yes, it bubbles the first time, but the second time they, they kind of disappear. And I'm left with a, a very nice color. But my dogs don't like it when I talk about it, so let's change the subject. Sorry, guys. All right, there we go. Enough of that. Let's uh, apply on some dots. Again, this is just a um, inexpensive, transparent amber color. It starts off usually in a much larger rod, and I'll pull it down to this size. So one side and then the opposite side and then kind of filling in between, uh, it will give you an even number of dots uh, that you're applying if you do it in a simple pattern. And then you can run parallel to it, slightly offset for the second group of dots. And then repeat on the other side. And of course this is uh, double speed, I'm not really that fast. Amber turns out to be a, a pretty good color. It's very compatible, doesn't cause much issues. And I like its earthy tones uh, combined with the blues, the greens, the reds. I use a real basic color palette and try to work mostly with colors that I've learned to trust. But there are some new colors that keep coming out that you just got to work with. Uh, some of them are awesome. So we've got our dots. Uh, now it's time to kind of heat it all in, apply a big flame, and we'll blow this out into a, a vessel shape. And kudos to GoPro for putting in that spot metering option. Uh, I wish I'd read about it before. So it does a much better exposure. This is. Uh, much better representation of what the human eye is seeing in the flame than in some of our previous videos before I noticed that feature on my camera. So just kind of balancing it out, blowing it out a little bit, keeping it round. So here we get to the fun part. We're going to weld up the, uh, the marbles. I'm going to straighten this up first is what I'm going to do right now. That's, uh, you see there's just a little bit of offset in it when I rotate it. So now it's getting trued up by rotating it into that arrowhead marver backing plate, watching that the axis isn't cranking around. Uh, so now we're getting back to the fun part. Uh, welding up the little marble cluster with the mushroom marble to the end, and then we're going to be opening up the opposite side and marvering it to uh, a specific roundness and uh, angle and uh, opening diameter. There we go, quite a bit of heat. Now I am blowing into the blow hose a little bit, just very gently as I'm slowly pulling that out. So the air pocket from the inside begins to join up with the marble just a little bit. And, and again, we're removing the stresses between the two, uh, removing acute angles, and checking that it's very true. So I've changed the hand direction here, uh, and now I'm rotating it again. This is double speed, at least I hope so that much coffee that day. Uh, just a really, really narrow, tight ring. Uh, and draw it out. And when it is just about ready to pull apart, don't let it collapse in, but rather puff it out a little bit, it will blow a hole which you can run right around the circumference and uh, have an open vessel right there. Please try to 
not blow bubble trash. You can gently control that and then immediately while it's still hot, kind of melt it down, get rid of it. Don't even let it turn into broken trash in your work area. Just apply enough heat right now that it's, it's uh, you know, maybe even usable again on some other project just as a flared out option. Uh, and then you can return to your other vessel fairly quickly. But keeping your work area clean and free of broken uh, glass and all the shards and uh, the tiny little flakes, uh, you, you don't want that in your, in your uh, body or your lungs. So a good big heat here just to melt in that uh, unevenness and let it become more uniform. And we'll marver it out just, or sorry, flare it out just a little bit there, truing up the lip and the end. Uh, and then applying uh, quite a bit of heat there. And then the first pass, just to get it to the approximate size, I'm going to use this rounded reamer and open it up just a little bit. And see, a little bit more doesn't quite fit it yet. So open it up to an adequate size. And it's not quite round yet. That won't occur until we roll it on this one here and give it a few passes. There we go. Now it's round enough that when I put the stopper in, it will uh, not have big gaps in it or be oval. You can easily see oval when you put a round cork or a stopper in one and there's an eighth inch gap on one side or two sides. So there we go again with the fume glass base. That's a, it's actually a tube in, in my hand uh, and it's hooked up to that large diameter rod just to use it as a handle that's sufficient diameter and thickness that it's strong. So we mashed it down into a flat disc and then backpedaled it a little bit to create that void in the bottom. And this little step here is going to save me from burning my uh, claw fingers uh, when I try to remove this base from the rest of that rod. So I'm just going to put a punty up to the inside of the bottom and then apply quite a bit of heat but in a very narrow ring and begin using the, the cutting edge of the arrowhead marver to separate the material. Uh, you don't actually have to pull it apart or anything. You don't even have to go very far into it but if you can create a channel around it, a V-shaped groove that you can put your flame into, it'll tend to stay in that groove and not move up and down when you go to cut this thing off. And you don't have to get uh, your claw fingers as hot in the flame as you're using the claw fingers to pull this off. Now remember, you can't punny up to the bottom inside of it because we're going to have put in a bunch of detail uh, stamped work with flowers and leaves and other things and fumed it. And if we were to put a punty in there, number one, it's likely to cause it to crack when we go to remove it. And, and two, there's no real good way to to polish and clean that up uh, with all the detail work on the bottom inside. So it's really a job for the fingers to hold on and remove this base from the material that it came from. So we're back to the stamping process. These are just the, there was a larger diameter center flower. I put uh, five smaller flowers around that. And then between each of the outer five flowers, uh, a little leaf pattern. And here, this is just the, it's like the handle of an X-Acto knife mounted on a handle I can rotate. And it's got the little crosshatch. And rotated on hot glass, it leaves a little diamond texture impression. And then here's just a dot of gold to give this kind of a cranberry fume. Sorry, silver first, in this case. It, it's fun to vary it. You can play with uh, silver and gold fume. Be sure you have good ventilation and that you're not breathing any of this. And then the cranberry color from the gold, which is very nice. And then I'm heating it all up enough that I'm going to be able to flatten the bottom again and get it nice and square uh, so it doesn't rock from any of the stamped impressions that may have pushed it out of uh, true uh, and kind of burn off the silver on the outside. Then I'm going to grab it with the claws and you can see that because of that narrow V-shaped groove I can put the heat into that and not make my tongue
tongue or my uh, fingers uh, glow. Not my fingers, but the fingers on my claws. Uh, if you get those too hot, they will melt. They can even leave an ugly scar on the work that you're working on. But more importantly, you've lost one of your favorite tools. And these are not uh, inexpensive tools, uh, at least not the quality ones. So quite a bit of heat there, a little ring of it. And again, using the uh, beveled edge of the arrowhead marvering pad to uh, separate that material and push it to the side allows me quicker access to the inside without heating up the fingers of my claws. And you can see how quickly that's going there. Even with a small, small flame, this is not a big surface mix torch. This is just a little tiny vector on some of its lowest setting, uh, removing this excess material. Go. Now there's a little bit more material there than I want still, uh, and we'll figure out what to do with that in just a minute. It's likely going to go on to the vessel portion and provide me with a small anchor spot for doing a wire wrap embellishment. So we can no longer pressurize the vessel. We've got that huge opening. So this is all going to be about timing and gravity. We're heating up the base sufficiently that it will hold some temperature and share with the vessel. And we're heating up the vessel enough that we can seamlessly integrate that material into its design. It, again, acute angles. If you don't know what an acute angle is, be sure to look it up because uh, they're your, they're your uh, nemesis here. So quite a bit of heat there again. We're going to do pretty much the same thing, but this time I'm going to very gently uh, pull it off, and it is straight below the axis of the mushroom. There you go, and then turn it upside down. Let gravity kind of help you out. And then change your perspective. Look at this thing lined up from the rear. Look at it from the side. Look at it from the other side. You have to keep rotating it in three dimensions to make sure that the thing is centered and straight where you want it to be. So tapped off that little piece on the rear, we'll fire polish that in. And do remember to fire polish the, the little punty places that you pull off. It's easy to forget one and when you get done with your entire project you'll find a little sharp spot that will really annoy you. So there's our, our finished vessel with the little mushroom sticking out the rear and the embellishments. And we'll stick that back in the kiln. I do like to reach in after I've placed them in. I'll use another tool, which is just a long glass hook, and sit it upright so that it's not sitting on its side while it's annealing. Uh, those bases, I, I found that they, they tend to heat, shed heat very evenly when they're sitting upright and very unevenly. Uh, when laying on their sides. I think that just kind of makes sense, but some people don't, uh, don't know how important that is. So try and orient everything symmetrically while you're annealing. All right, thank you. Please subscribe.